cease your ire, you angry stars of heaven. Wind, rain, and thunder remember earthly men. So I love Pericles. It's a play that bewilders scholars uh, in a way that I think doesn't bewilder audiences at all. Um, I think audiences love the play too. I think there's something just very, there's something so true about it. And um, it's interesting to think about Pericles relative to the late romance plays and particularly um, Winter's Tale. You know, Pericles, uh, Pericles trods that same that same ground that Winter's Tale does. There's a king, he loses his wife and daughter, he thinks them to be dead, and you know, 16 years later, uh, they're, they're restored to, to him, they're restored as a family. Pericles covers that same ground. You know, Pericles loses his wife, loses his daughter, and all these years later has them restored to him. Um, but where Winter's Tale, one could read as a sort of morality play. Leontes does something very bad. He loses everything on account of it. He's guided through his uh, repentance by Paulina, and having proven himself sufficiently repentant, everything is restored to him. Pericles is very different, and in my, to my mind, a much more mature play and a more sophisticated play in that uh, I don't think Pericles does anything wrong to lose everything, and he doesn't do anything particularly right to get it all back. Um, it's, it's, there's something very true about that. It feels true to our lives, and I think that's why audiences love this play. I think it feels real to them. You know, if, if you live long enough, there's uh, unimaginable beauty that's going to show up in all of our lives, and there is unspeakable tragedy that's going to show up in all of our lives, because that's what it is to live a life. And I think that's a lot of what is being charted and explored in Pericles. It's a very human play, and where Winter's Tale, as I read it, is a morality play. It's a religious play of a kind, and I think Pericles is not a religious play, but I think it's a deeply spiritual one uh, with pirates. So there's, uh, um, there's so much that's fun in it as well, uh, but it's a, it's a I think at bottom a deeply serious play and a serious examination of what it is to live a life. So it makes great sense to me that it's one of Shakespeare's late plays and a playwright writing at the height of his gifts. Uh, so I have a great collaborator named Jack Herrick who's uh, part of the legendary band the Red Clay Ramblers. Uh, Jack composed the production. The first time I worked with Jack was actually on a production of Pericles at Playmakers Repertory Company, which is the theater that I lead. Um, and Jack composed the music and played the music for the show, uh, and will do so again for us here at, at OSF. Uh, you know, the, first, the very first lines of the play, Pericles, are, is Gower, who is our narrator, and the first lines of the play is uh, to sing a song that old was sung. And we thought, well, what if we take that at its word and allow the play to live a little bit in a sort of troubadour tradition, a, sto a musical storytelling tradition where Gower is our singer-songwriter, he's our narrator, he's taking, us on, he's taking us on our journey through the play and using music um, in that way. So Jack, you know, Jack pulls from the folk tradition in the music for this play, a bit from the Celtic tradition in service to this play, um, in a way that I think helps the play really uh, meaningfully. You know, one of the great joys of Pericles is that it, 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 it keeps hurtling forward. The play keeps moving. It doesn't spend a lot of time sitting down and admiring itself. And one of the great advantages of having a narrator, it's the only play that uses a chorus or narrator uh, other than Henry V in Shakespeare's plays. And the chorus functions, Gower functions as our chorus in Pericles, much like the chorus does in Henry V, in that Gower comes out, tells us what we need to know so that he can just keep dropping the needle on the good parts. So like Pericles, doesn't, there's not a lot of, we don't spend a ton of time in these long expository scenes. Like the thing just goes from, from, from important moment to important moment to important moment. And, um, he is set on his journey by a series of events. He is taken by, there, there are two shipwrecks in the play. He finds himself in various lands. It's 
Um, you know, whatever else the play is, it's this wonderful uh, adventure story, an adventure yarn, which is uh, uh, part of the great fun of the play. And I think part of the delight for audiences is this headlong forward momentum of the piece. The entire play, so the play goes to so many different uh, locales. Uh, you know, there's Tyre and Pentapolis and Tarsus and Antioch, and the play moves all the way And all of these these cities that are all different from one another. But what all these cities have in common that Pericles visits, they're, they're all by the sea. They're all by the ocean. This play has the sea in its ears continually. So in terms of the costume world of the play, I think we understand that all of these lands that are visited are all seaside. They're by the ocean. So I think there's a lot that is uh, the sun, salt blasted, sand blasted, um, uh, um, and doing that in the, and, and putting that play in the Thomas Theater, you know, where, where you have, and doing it in a, in a thrust configuration is such a, an advantage for this play. Um, I think there's very little that is declamatory about this play. I don't think it is a. I don't think it's a. I don't think it's a rhetorical exercise. I think it's a human exercise. And I think playing it in that beautiful, intimate room, uh, allowing the actors to simply step through the play in a way that we can really feel them and understand them. Um, is I think really important and a huge advantage by making it in that room. And so a clothing world that isn't hugely decorative, it's not about putting tons of, it's not about building walls and layers between us and them, but rather looking for a kind of transparency where we can really see the actors. And the play is built as a, as a series of photo negatives. There's the bad daughter and the good daughter, and the bad, the, the bad father, good father. There's um, uh, the bad wife and the good wife. And a lot of the doubling in the play will be asking the same actor to play both ends of this spectrum. So I think real fun for the actors. And I don't think it's a matter of disguise. I don't think it's about, oh, I can't believe that's the same actor who played this. We want to be able to see that actor be the really bad father in Antiochus and then the very fun goofball father as Simonides in a way that's rather transparent. Um, so making sure that we figure that out in the clothing world of the play will be important as well. For whatever reason, I can't think of another Shakespeare play where the gap between how scholars view the play uh, and where uh, and how audiences view the play is as wide as it is with this play. Scholars struggle with this play mightily in a way that audiences just never seem to. Audiences in Shakespeare's day, it was understood to have been a very popular play in Shakespeare's own lifetime. Um, and my own experience with the play is that audiences just don't struggle with it. It's a, a, a you know, the, the opportunity to see this play in production is a great gift because it's a, it is a, it is a fantastic and beautiful and far more sophisticated play. Uh, than many scholars believe it to be. And I think audiences relate to the play uh, very easily and in a rather uncomplicated way, which is a delight.